Hello. Today we begin Unit 3 of our course. And in Unit 3, we will be discussing electricity. So, let's start with a discussion on electric charges. Electricity is fundamental to nature. What does that mean? It means everything that the universe is made up of contains electric charges. In fact, the three fundamental quantities that make up the building blocks of the universe are mass, charge and spin that determines the symmetry of particles. So electric charge is a fundamental quantity in nature. Now atoms which are the basic constituents of all matter is made up of electrically charged particles. I'm sure most of you know what these electrically charged particles are. Now this is the classical picture of an atom where you have a nucleus that contains protons. Protons carry a positive charge and electrons that is in a cloud around the nucleus carries negative charge. Now what is the special characteristic of an atom? An atom carries two types of basic charges that are present in the universe and that is a positive charge carried by a proton and a negative charge carried by an electron. Now the amount of positive charge carried by a proton equal to the amount of negative charge carried by an electron. So if you keep a proton and an electron together there will be no net charge. When there is no net charge we say the object is neutral. An atom in the normal case is a neutral object because it contains equal amounts of positive and negative charges. Protons which are found at the core of the atom carry a positive electric charge and we represent that by the lowercase e. And these protons are fixed to their relative positions. You see, you can see electrons are free to move about, but protons are fixed to their relative positions. So, when we talk about motion of electric charges, we actually mean motion of negatively charged electrons. All right? Positive charges or positively charged protons are fixed to their relative positions and they do not move. Electrons are found moving in the space surrounding the core of the atom and they carry an equal and opposite amount of charge, negative E. Well, this is another picture of the classical atom. Well, this is really not the picture, the true picture of the atom, but for our purpose, the classical picture of the atom is good enough. All right, so E is the fundamental unit of charge. What does that mean? E is the fundamental unit of charge. It means all other charges come in multiples of this E. E is the basic quantity. You cannot divide the, the unit charge. You cannot divide that any further. So this is the basic charge, the fundamental unit of charge. And this means that charge carried by anything else comes in multiples of E. A proton and an electron together form a neutral object with no net electric charge. What does that mean? This means that the neutral object, although we say an object like this is neutral, does it mean that it contains no electric charges? No, everything in the universe is made up of electric charges. So when we say this object is neutral, it means it contains equal amounts or equal numbers of positive and negative charges. Electric charge is measured in a unit called Coulomb. 
and we will be using it uh, profusely as we go on. Uh, one column is actually a very large unit. You divide, so you have smaller units like millicolumb, which is a thousandth of a column, microcolumb, which is a millionth of a column, nanocolumb, and so on. We will be using a lot of these. Microcolumb, see how you write microcolumb, mu c, nanocolumb, and so on. Now, this is the value of the fundamental unit of electric charge, E equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulomb. This is the charge carried by an electron and also a proton. Charge carried by the electron is negative, charge carried by the proton is positive. Let's do a small problem. A charge equal to the charge of Avogadro's number. We have seen Avogadro's number, is that right? What is Avogadro's number? The number of atoms in one mole of a substance, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. The charge equal to the charge of Avogadro's number of protons is called a Faraday. So, you take Avogadro number of protons or Avogadro number of electrons, that much the amount of charge carried by that many protons is called one Faraday. Now, how much is that? Calculate the number of columns in a Faraday. Well, if this is the total number of protons in that make up Avogadro's number and each proton carry what amount of charge? Each proton carries the basic unit of charge 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulomb. So what all we need to do is multiply the total number of protons by the charge carried by a proton. So the charge of this many protons. Each proton carries this basic unit. Therefore, the charge carried by these many protons is the number of protons multiplied by the charge carried by one proton. That is 96,440 coulomb. This is an important quantity in chemistry. The, this is called a Faraday. The amount of charge carried by Avogadro number of protons is called a Faraday, and that is 96,440 coulombs. It's a very large amount of electric charge. Next problem. How many coulombs of negative charge are there in one gram of copper? Well, one gram of copper, we need to know how many atoms are there in one gram of copper. How do you know? Well, we know it from the atomic mass of copper. What is the atomic mass of copper? 63.5 gram. That is the atomic mass of copper. This means that one mole of copper is 63.5 gram. That is the meaning of atomic mass. We talked about it in the last unit. So, atomic mass of copper is 63.5 means that one mole of copper has a mass of 63.5 gram. And one mole of copper contains how many atoms? Avogadro number of atoms. That means 63.5 gram of copper contains Avogadro's number of atoms. And what is that number? 6.02 times 10 to the 23. One mole of copper contains Avogadro number of atoms. That means 63.5 gram of copper contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms. Therefore, the number of atoms in one gram 
Can you tell me what that will be? This many atoms are contained in 63.5 gram of copper. Therefore, what is the number of atoms in one gram of copper? That will be the total number divided by its mass. And that is 9.48 times 10 to the 21 atoms are there in one gram of copper. Well, what is the atomic number of copper? You remember the atomic number of copper? The atomic number of copper is 29. It means each atom of copper carries 29 electrons. Now, there are these many atoms in one gram of copper. 9.48 times 10 to the 21 atoms. And each atom carries 29 electrons. So, how many electrons are there in one gram of copper? The number of electrons in one gram of copper is the total number of atoms multiplied by the number of electrons per atom and that is 2.7 times 10 to the 23 electrons. Alright, and now you know each electron carries the basic unit of electric charge. Therefore, the total charge carried by all these electrons which are contained in one gram of copper will be these many electrons multiplied by the charge carried by one electron. It's the number of electrons in one gram of copper multiplied by the charge carried by one electron and that is 43,200 54 coulombs. That's a tremendous amount of electric charge. One gram of copper carries 43,254 coulombs of charge. In fact, one human, human body actually carries millions of coulombs of electric charge. Well, <laughs> all those electric charges are enough to destroy or burn the whole universe. But still, nothing happens. Why? Because these negative and positive charges coexist in a very peaceful manner in our beautiful universe. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Let's now talk about conductors and insulators. Materials, the electrical property of materials. We can divide materials into two groups, conductors and insulators. Well, you know in, from our earlier discussion that protons are fixed to their relative positions. But electrons are free to move about. Now, but not all electrons are just free. They are confined to their atoms, but motion is associated with electrons. Electrons can move about. Is that right? Electrons are free to move. In some materials, especially metals, electrons that are relatively farther away from the nucleus. You know that electrons actually exist in a cloud around the nucleus. Now, Electrons that are comparatively farther away from the nucleus are not very closely attached to the nucleus. That means they tend to move from one atom to the other. In other words, in a metal, there is a cloud of electrons that can move about. You see? Now, that means a metal allows the free flow of electrons in it. And such a material is called a, a good conductor of electric charges. So, some materials, especially metals, electrons that are relatively at large distances from the core of the atom are rather loosely bound to the atom and are virtually free to move about in the material. Now, let me see if... I can show that to you. Give me a second.
Here I have an animation that shows how the electrons in the outer orbits or electrons that are relatively far from the center of each atom behave. They are virtually free and you can see they move about. Electrons can move from one atom to the other. You see those electrons really do not belong to any particular atom. They can be called drifters. That means there are a large number of these kind of drifters in a conductor. All metals are good conductors. Now, that means these electrons can be made to move from one end of the conductor to the other. And that is how we get an electric current. Now, you remember we talked about current. When electric charges are made to move, we have a current. So, a good conductor will allow the motion of electric charges in it. This aluminum rod that I'm holding is a good conductor. That means, if I place some excess charge on this, it will spread right through the material. The aluminum allows the free flow of electric charges in it. It is a good conductor of electricity. So such materials are called conductors. Most metals are considered to be good conductors of electric charges. In some other materials, electrons are localized and are not allowed to move from one part of the material to another. Now, this is a good example of such a material. Well, one of those scribble layers, a pen, is that right? Plastic. Now, atoms in here, the electrons in the atoms here are localized. They are not allowed to move about. Now, such a material is an insulator. So, materials can be conductors or insulators. Such materials do not allow electric charges to flow through them and are called insulators. Now, both conductors and insulators play vital roles in building of electrical circuits. You see, we are able to enjoy electrical circuits. Our life is so much controlled these days by electrical circuits. When you use a cell phone, you are using a very sophisticated electrical circuit. Now, how is it possible that we are able to use that electrical circuit? Because there are conductors and insulators. If all the materials were good conductors of electricity, what would have happened? You would never be able to build an electrical circuit. You will never be able to wire your home to use electricity. Because if every object is a good conductor of electricity, all electricity will flow to the earth. We will never be able to use electricity. In fact, our life would be miserable. Well, in fact, there will be no life, actually, in fact. So, we owe, again, a lot of the good things that we enjoy in our life to conductors and insulators. What about interaction between electric charges? Now, how do electric charges interact? What are the two fundamental types of electric charges? Negative charges and positive charges. The fundamental properties of electric charges are like charges repel. That means two proton, two positive charges placed together will move away from each other. Similarly, two negative charges will move away from each other. So, like charges will repel and unlike charges will attract. A negative charge will attract a positive charge. Unlike charges will attract. Now, a negative charge will attract a positive charge. A negative charge will repel a negative charge. A positive charge will repel a positive charge. If the presence of free electric charges can be detected by using an electroscope. 
This is called an electroscope. Now look at some of the parts of the electroscope. The electroscope has a conducting platform and you, it has a conducting stem and it has a conducting leaf. The leaf is very thin, it can move very easily. So, what happens when you place some extra charge on the platform? Because the stem is conducting, it will move along the stem and that means the leaves, leaves are also conducting. So the stem and the leaves will acquire the same type of charge. What will happen? The leaves would then want to move away because the like charges will repel. So the leaves will diverge and the extent of divergence will give you an, a, an idea of the amount of charge placed on the electroscope. An electroscope like the one shown on the left can be used to detect the presence of an electric charge. It consists of a conducting platform, a conducting stem and a conducting leaf. The stem and the leaves are enclosed in a glass case so that the leaves will not be disturbed. Now, if some excess charge is placed on the platform, it spreads onto the stem and the leaves, which are all conducting. That means as the leaves and the stem acquire similar charges, the leaves move away from the stem. Now, here is an animation of it. Now, you place some excess charge on here. There you are. Now, the stem and the leaves both have the same excess charge, therefore the leaves move away. Now, you see what happened when somebody came and touched the air. When somebody came and touched, all these excess charges simply disappeared. This is called the grounding. We will talk about that. But at the moment, you see how the leaves diverge. And the extent of divergence is a measure of the amount of charge. Look at once again, when an amount of charge is placed there, the leaves will diverge. All right. On the other hand, I want you to look at this one. When an amount of positive charge is placed, again the leaves diverge. Now what happens when you touch it? Now did the positive charges move away? No. Look when a negative charges are moving in to neutralize the positive charges. You see, motion is associated only with negative charges. Positive charges cannot move away. If you touch a positively charged object, negative charges from the earth will come in and neutralize the positively charged object. So the extent of divergence is proportional to the amount of extra charge on the platform. Now, how do you charge? In the beginning of this lesson, I told you that all objects, including my pen, are electrically neutral. Now, I'm going to rub this with uh, my jacket. You know, I'm wearing a, a jacket made of wool. If I rub this uh, with my jacket, and if you see, there is a small piece of paper lying on this. Now, do you see what happened? That paper jumped onto this pen. Now, what happens? What is the process? Well, the neutral object, which is this pen, is now electrically charged. What happens? When I rubbed it with wool, some electrons from the wool actually got transferred into this pen. That means the pen now has an excess amount of negative charge. It is this excess amount of negative charge that attracted the paper. Now, some time ago, I explained to you that an electroscope can be used to detect the presence of electric charges. Now, I have a very crude 
model of an electric an electroscope here. Let me try and focus it a bit more. In place of the platform that I showed you in the picture, this is a spherical, uh, spherical platform, and this is the conducting stem, and those are the conducting leaves. If I place an excess amount of charge on the sphere, it will spread on to the conducting stem and onto the leaves. Now, let me see if I can do that one more time by rubbing this pen with my, with my wool jacket. And if I'm successful, I will be able to place some excess charge onto the electroscope. Did you see what happened? The electroscope is now electrically charged. You see, I placed the electrically charged pen on the platform of the electroscope, which then charged the electroscope. See what happens when I touch it. Well, the charges have actually disappeared. Now, I will be working with this a little more as we go on. So, that obviously means that a neutral object can be electrically charged. We now know that all objects are neutral, electrically neutral, which means that they contain equal amounts of positive and negative charges. Now, some negative charges are moved, if some negative charges are moved from one object to the other, in fact, what I did here is moved some negative charges from my jacket to this pen. So what happened? The pen now has an excess amount of negative charge and therefore we say the pen is negatively charged and my jacket now lost some electrons. When the jacket lost some electrons, it has some excess positive charge. So we say the jacket is positively charged and the pen is negatively charged. So it is possible that we can charge an object either positively or negatively. A positively charged object we will represent like this. Does it mean that this contains only positive charges? No. It means it contains some excess positive charge. That means some negative charges are missing. In the same way, the pen has now acquired some negative charges. It will be called a negatively charged object. We will represent it like this. But remember the total amount of charge in the universe is a constant. Now, if the jacket loses electrons, the pen will gain them. That means the total amount of electric charge will remain a constant. Now this is called the principle of conservation of electric charge. And this is true for the whole of the universe. Electric charges can get transferred from one object to another. But the total amount of electric charge in the universe is a, is a constant. So, if two objects form a closed system, the total amount of charge they hold will remain a constant, even though charges could flow from one object to the other. The amount of charge lost by one object will be equal to the amount of charge gained by the other object. Does it sound familiar? Well, in the principle of calorimetry, we had a similar situation. Well, how do we charge an object either positively or negatively? That's what we discussed uh, so far today. Now, when a polythene rod is rubbed with fur, now that is uh, another way of charging object. This is a polythene sheet. If I can rub it with fur, rub it very, very well, I'm going to rub it. If I do that, the same phenomenon can happen. Now, 
electrons from fur will get transferred to the polythene sheet. Now let's see if the polythene sheet has some excess charge. Let's try and bring it close to the electroscope and see what happens. Now you can see the electroscope is now charged. Look at the leaves of the electroscope. I have been able to charge the electroscope. Now if I touch, you can see when I touched, all the charges disappeared. Now what happened when I touched? My body, all human bodies are good conductors of electricity. So when I gave an excess amount of charge to this, when I touched it, those excess charges moved to the earth through me. I am a good conductor. We say the object has been grounded. But we will talk about that as we go on. So here we got the polythene sheet rubbed with fur. What happened? Fur lost electrons. That means the fur now has an excess amount of positive charge. And the polythene gained electrons. We have a polythene sheet that is now negatively charged and the fur that is positively charged. Now this is made possible by electrons getting transferred from fur to plastic leaving fur positively charged and plastic negatively charged. Now a similar situation occurs when a glass rod is rubbed with silk. Now, but the process now is slightly different. What happens when a glass rod is rubbed with silk? I have a glass rod here and I'm going to rub it with silk. Well, the result of this experiment may not be very convincing, so you need to watch very carefully. All right, I'm going to rub the glass rod with silk. I need to probably rub it it's a little more vigorously and I have the electroscope I hope you can see the leaves of the electroscope all right I'm going to touch it you can see it's charged positively now I want to show you something I'm going to now bring a negatively charged plastic sheet near it all right what is the charge on the electroscope now the electroscope is now charged positively. You see what happens when I bring a negatively charged rod near it. You see that? Why is the leaves collapsing? Because these negative charges will drive down more negative charges to the leaves and the positively charged leaves get neutralized. If I now touch it, well, the electroscope actually now got neutralized because the charge on the plastic sheet is negative. Okay, well, now you know how we can charge objects either positively or negatively. Now, this is because electrons from glass rod move to the silk. You see, this time when you rub the glass rod with silk, the electrons from uh, the electrons from the glass rod move to the silk, leaving the glass rod with an excess amount of positive charge, and of course the silk got some excess amount of negative charge. Now, thus a positively charged object has some excess positive charge and a negatively charged object has some excess negative charge. The Earth is a large reservoir of electric charges. Actually, Earth can absorb, take in large quantities of electric charge. That means if you touch a charged object, the excess charge in the object will flow to the Earth through your body, as I just showed you, when I was discharging the electroscope. Now, that means the object will become neutral. Any charged object will become neutral when you connect to the earth. Now, have you seen that most of the electrical appliances in your home is connected to a three pin? 
Now, one pin bring the electricity to the appliance, the other will return it. And the third connects your appliance to the earth. You know why it is important? Suppose there is some leak that electricity gets onto the body of your electrical appliance. Then that leaked electricity will flow to the earth. It's a safety precaution. Now every electrical appliance which uses high voltage and current needs to be grounded, needs to be connected to the earth. Connecting to the earth will allow the electric charges to flow to the earth safely. And this process is called grounding. In electrical circuit, we use this symbol for grounding. So where you see this symbol, it means the electrical circuit is connected to the earth at that point. Now here I have a diagram on charging a neutral object by conduction. Actually, I showed you how the electroscope is charged by conduction. What did I do? I, I had a negatively charged object. You remember the negatively charged object I had was the, the negatively charged plastic sheet. This one. Now, when I brought this, this is the neutral electroscope. How do I know this is neutral? Because the leaves are not diverged. Now, when you touch it to the platform of the electroscope, what happens? Some excess charges will move from the charged object to the electroscope because the platform of the electroscope is a good conductor. And those excess charges then will move through the stem and to the leaves, and you can see the leaves will diverge. If you now move the charged object away, the electroscope will retain some excess charges. Now what is the phenomenon that happened here? The phenomenon is sharing of charges. By making a charged object in contact with a neutral object, the, ch the charges from the charged object got shared. Now, but the total amount of charge in the two object system will not change. The total amount of charge remains a constant. That's right, that's something that you should not forget. Now here is the neutral electroscope. You can see I have touched it. All the charges on it has flown to the earth. And I'm now going to charge this plastic sheet by rubbing it onto my jacket. Now, my woolen jacket come very handy, actually, so I'm trying to see if I can charge that plastic sheet negatively. And, of course, my jacket will be then getting charged positively. Now, bring the negative charges and touch the electroscope. You can see it has not been very spectacular. Well, there you can see the electroscope has been charged positively. Now that means the charges has been shared. Well, let's see what happens when I touch the knob. Well, the charges have been, the electroscope has been discharged. Well, I'm, I'm trying to see uh, if I can do that a bit more. You see, it's, sometimes it is pretty hard because if the atmosphere is not very dry, the moment you create the excess charge, they tend to leak through the atmosphere. You see, uh, damp atmosphere is a good conductor. There you can see, there has been a good sharing of electric charges there. The electroscope has got a fair amount of charge now. Now, the charge electroscope, I'm going to touch it. You can see it's been discharged, it's been grounded. Well, so now you know how to charge an electroscope by conduction. Conduction is the process by which the charged object is made in contact with the neutral conductor so that the charges can flow. But remember, only positive charges, only negative charges are allowed to move. 
positive charges are not allowed to move. All right. So, if I now charge this glass rod positively, how, how will the... Now, let me see if that can be done. If I charge this glass rod positively, I cannot guarantee you that this is going to work, but uh, we will try. And if I make it in contact, you can see, yes, the electroscope really got charged, but not very spectacularly. Now tell me, how did this happen? Can positive charges move to the electroscope? Is this what happened? Think about it. Well, here is an illustration of how a neutral object is charged by conduction using a positively charged object. We have a neutral object, and you bring a positively charged object and keep it in contact with the neutral conductor. You can see the neutral conductor is insulated. This is an insulator. Now, what happens is, Positive charges cannot move from here to the neutral conductor. So, you can see a neutral conductor contains large amount of negative charges as well as positive charges. So, negative charges from the neutral conductor move to the charged object. Now, you can see for every electron that moves from the neutral conductor to the charged conductor, a positive charge is left behind here. That means a, an electron moving from here to here is the same effect as a positive charge moving from here to here. And therefore, the neutral object will now gain positive charge. And when you remove the charged object, the neutral object will retain positive charges. Now this is how you charge a neutral object by conduction, either positively or negatively. Now how do we charge an electroscope by induction? What is the meaning of induction, to induce? Now, in order to charge an electroscope or any other object by conduction, what we did is, we placed the charged object in contact with the neutral conductor. Now, in charging an object by induction, you don't make the charged object in contact with the neutral conductor. You bring it near the neutral conductor. Do not make contact. You see, what happens? Let's talk about it. Now, bring a positively charged object close to an electroscope platform, what happens? Here is, here is a positively charged object. You bring it to the platform of an electroscope, what happens is, you see, because of the presence of the positive charge, the negative charges from all over this conducting body, look at this, the leaves, the stem, and the platform, are all conducting. So all the free electrons will be drawn to the top of the electroscope, leaving the leaves positively charged. That means the moment you bring a charged object near the electroscope, you will see a divergence. Why? Because, because of the presence of these positive charges, a lot of negative charges moved to the platform because of their desire to be closer to this positive charge. That means a lot of negative charges were moved from the leaves, leaving the leaves positively charged. And that produces the divergence layer. Because the presence of a positive charge very close to it, negative charges from the stem and the leaves of the electroscope move to the platform leaving an excess positive charge in the leaves. Now, this process is called polarization. What does polarization mean? Polarization is a split. Don't you, have you ever heard of polarization in a political party? Yes. A split of ideas in a political party is referred to as polarization. 
The split of electric charges in a conductor is called polarization. And what is the cause of this polarization? The presence of this charged object. Now, the leaves diverge due to the presence of this excess positive charge. All right, this is step one of charging an electroscope by induction. So what is step one? Bring a charged object. In this case, we are using a positively charged object. Bring a positively charged object near the electroscope. Now, the negative charges get drawn to the platform, leaving the leaves positively charged. You see the leaves diverge. The second step is ground the conductor, ground the electroscope by touching. If you now touch the electroscope, what happens is because of these positive charges, uh, a lot of negative charges will now move from the earth, will come and neutralize those positive charges. That will cause the leaves to collapse. And now that means you have removed some excess positive charges from this neutral conductor. And now remove the grounding. What happens? Those positive charges which were on the leaves are no longer there. They are removed because of the grounding. That means the electroscope now has some excess charge. And now if you remove the charged object, the electroscope will retain those negative charges. And this is how you charge an electroscope by induction. All right. Now here I have the various steps of that. Now look at this. Bring the charge. Here I have got a negatively charged object brought near the... This is the neutral conductor. And I'm going to bring a negatively charged object close to it. All right, let's start from the beginning. We start with a neutral conductor. There is one. The neutral conductor, bring a negatively charged object close to it. What do you call this? Polarization. You see, the negative charges all now go to the earth. You ground the neutral conductor. Now, there is an excess amount of positive charge in the neutral conductor. When the charged object is removed, the neutral conductor retains a net positive charge. You see, in my earlier explanation, I used a positive charge. In here, we use a negative charge. Look at polarization. Negative charges move away. And when you ground it, those negative charges move to the earth leaving a net amount of positive charge in the conductor. All right. Now, let me see if I can illustrate that over here. I want to charge this neutral electroscope by induction by using this negatively charged object. What's the first step? Bring the negatively charged object near the electroscope. You see, I haven't, I haven't touched it. But look at the leaves diverging. Why? Because all the negative charges are drawn to the sphere, leaving the, leaving the leaves positively charged. Now what happens when I ground it? Now keeping the charged object there, I ground it. That means all those positive charges in the leaves have gone to the ground. Now remove the grounding and remove the charged object. Well, apparently I grounded it again, but the electroscope now has some excess negative charge. Now, this is the process of charging by induction. Charging by induction. And you must be familiar with the various process of charging by induction. You can see, bring the charged object near the neutral conductor ground the neutral conductor, remove the grounding, and remove the charged objects. These are the steps for charging by induction.